I am sure that I am live already. I'm just waiting for this screen to let me know. I am sure. That there we go. Hello. Hello. This is One Great Earth. My name is Dan. Got a lot to get into. Now, uh, just for some background information, I have a YouTube channel where I reach 6,500 subscribers. Okay. But YouTube's making it difficult to process any claims of, uh, whatever they're claiming, uh, that I'm doing is, uh, circumventing systems and shocking content. Climate change can be shocking. The biggest problem has been just the automated ant backend system without any real help. They removed my ability to contact them, but it was my mistake 10 years ago when I set the account up, I set it up as an organization instead of an individual, which means that for to be able to appeal anything, I have to have an actual business named after my uh, YouTube or my YouTube account. So I am trying Twitch for the first time, One Great Earth. We go over climate change, media, and related news. It's uh, just like uh, what? Let's see here. Heat wave. U.S. heat wave expected to break more records following multiple deaths in Oregon. Forecast predicts most dangerous portion of the heat wave would last through Tuesday evening in Pacific Northwest. This is from The Guardian. The Pacific Northwest braced for more sweltering temperatures on Tuesday as authorities in Oregon reported multiple heat-related deaths with forecasters warning that the dangerous weather wasn't over yet. Officials in the Multnomah County, which includes Portland, have said they are investigating four suspected deaths linked to the heat wave, which has cooked the region in triple digit temperatures for days on end. The county medical examiner was investigating at least three heat related deaths reported on Friday and Sunday, officials said, involving county residents who were 64, 75, and 84 years old. Those are bad numbers to hear, but it's dangerous. We're seeing parts of California roll up in 120, 125 degree weather. Death Valley wants to break its current record. Dozens of locations in the West and Pacific Northwest tied to broke previous heat records over the weekend and are expected to keep doing so into the week. Portland saw record daily temperatures on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday and was on track to do so for a fourth consecutive day with a forecasted high of 102 38.9 Celsius on Monday, said National Weather Service NWS meteorologist Hannah Chandler Cooley. Salem also set a new record, hitting 103 degrees Fahrenheit, 39.4 degrees Celsius, on Sunday and topping the 99 Fahrenheit mark set in 1960. An NWS forecast predicted the most dangerous portion of the heat wave would last through Tuesday evening. We are looking at the potential for breaking more records, said Chandri Cooley. Multnomah County had been operating several daytime cooling centers to provide relief to the people more vulnerable to heat-related illnesses. The U.S. Northwest, better known for its rain and cooler climates, has been rocked by brutal heat waves in recent years, including a 2021 heat wave that was blamed for hundreds of deaths. The temperatures aren't expected to reach as high as they did during that 2021 heat wave, which killed an estimated 600 people across Oregon, Washington, and Western Canada. 
but the duration could be problematic because many homes in the region lack air conditioning. Round the clock hot weather, which you know, which is, we're talking about really brutal weather here. We're talking about it's over 100 degrees at night and it's over 85 degrees at, uh, it's over 100 degrees during the day and it's over 85 degrees during the night. You don't get much relief except from the sun. It's still unbearably hot in so many places. And these temperature fluctuations, these temperatures are fluctuating in ways that we're not adapted to. Our homes aren't built in areas that's designed to withstand uh, heat. All of a sudden, it has to withstand even more heat. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't redesign and rethink areas. Builders have to rethink homes, have to rethink insulation in the areas that they thought would be less moist. It, climate change it is, is an all-encompassing term. It accomplishes so much to cover from people to the planet to everything in between that we experience, our experience as a human being on this planet as, a war as the air gets warmer. We are riding the top of our tropics though hopefully returns to some kind of normalcy after a very hot year in the tropics around the Antarctica as well and the Arctic are seeing rapid fluctuations rapid changes the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere and the nor northern hemisphere are seeing rapid fluctuations I digress the temperatures aren't expected to reach as high as they did. Yes, yes, we read this around the clock. Yes, I didn't scroll down. <laughs> Heat, illness, and injury are cumulative and can build over the course of a day or days, officials have warned. That's like a misnomer of heat-related illnesses is that they have to be sudden and onset. Not true. They can work very slowly. For people that work in the heat like this, they might feel like, oh, the, you know, these days are just getting to them. It might be, a, at, they might be at risk of having heat stroke. It's more common and easier of a state to reach than possible, than thought possible, especially when we're seeing record-breaking temperatures sweeping across. And no, we're not saying that Dallas, Texas, never saw a temperature as they're seeing you know, 405 degrees. We're not saying that these cities haven't seen individual temperatures. What we're saying is that these sweltering uh, temperatures are affecting multiple states at once and creating red alerts, that's uh, fire alerts. Let's say uh, even Alaska, it might be in the 50s and 60s, but they're at planning level five, PL5, and they have smoke jumpers everywhere. People are bracing for a lot to go down this summer, and it's, it's worrying. It's worrying that our days are becoming hotter and our nights aren't becoming cooler. It is a big deal. In Death Valley National Park, where temperatures reached 128 degrees Fahrenheit, a motorcyclist died from heat exposure over the weekend while another motorcyclist was hospitalized with severe heat illness. It, it's, it's, a, it's an illness that creeps up on you. You don't see it coming. It's not just from sitting out in the heat all day and you're suddenly you are a heat stroke. It is more complicated than that, more nuanced. But the end could be the end of the human being as we just die.
British Columbia also had a massive heat wave that was very uh, a tragic. These heat waves, these heat domes, these uh, high pressure systems that trap in a lot of heat that go over the area, that stay over the area, that pull in a lot of heat. They're creeping around and every time they hit, it's uh, a huge, huge, uh, tremendous increase in temperatures as the high temperature range right here in the Northeast Midwest. And you see the temperatures are fluctuating or changing when pressed against this high pressure system here out in the ocean. Uh, looks like there's two here. This is from the World Meteorological Organization, WMO. Record, record temperature streak continues in June. The average global temperature has been 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial air for 12 successive months, according to new data issued by the European Union's Copernicus Climate Change Service. More on that in a moment. The multi-day length and record warm overnight temperatures will continue to cause heat stress in people without adequate cooling and hydration. The weather has also fueled the outbreak of new wildfires as hot, dry conditions meet flammable grasses that dried out after a wet winter. A wildfire in the mountains of Santa Barbara County grew to more than 26,000 acres by Tuesday morning. Horses forcing evacuations of the area, including at the former Neverland Ranch once owned by Michael Jackson. Further north, the Shelley Fire, which erupted in California's Marble Mountain Wilderness, has grown to more than 6,000 acres and is 0% contained. And a small but smoky blaze, dubbed the Royal Fire, has burned through more than 150 acres or 60 hectares of forest west of Lake Tahoe and sent ash raining down in the tourist town of Truckee, California. The U.S. heat wave came as the global temperature in June was record warm for the 13th straight month and marked its 12th straight month that the world was 1.5 degrees C warmer than pre-industrial times, the European Climate Service Copernicus said. It was the hottest June on record for the globe. This is when I started really getting into this channel and paying attention to it was uh, June and July last year being the hottest on record. And that trend never stopped. It's going to be the 13th hottest month on record. This is alarming. And it's not going away and we're making it worse. Some people actively ignore it. Some people actively fight it. What nobody is doing, though, is talking about what's going to happen when the, the horse's back is broken. Not just the leg, but the entire horse is broken. What do you do? There's no way to repair it. There's no way to fix it. It might be too late. We're not looking at quality of life here. I digress. It was the hottest June on record for the globe and the 13th month in a row to set a monthly temperature record. While unusual, a similar streak of monthly global temperature records happened previously in 2015-2016. 
according to Copernicus Climate Change Service ERA5 data, the month was 1.5 degrees Celsius above the estimated June average for 1850 to 1900, the designated pre-industrial reference period. This is the 12th consecutive month to reach or break the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold. The global average temperature for the past 12 month period, July 2023 to June 2024, is 1.64 degrees Celsius above the 1850 to 1900 pre industrial average, according to the ERA 5 dataset. The sea surface temperature averaged for June 2024 over 60 degrees south, 60 degrees north, was 20.85 degrees Celsius, the highest value on record for the month. Responding to messages, I apologize. I have severe ADHD. It can be very debilitating. So using this channel, I kind of use it as a creative outlet to try to get some of the energy out. Otherwise, you know, it comes out somewhere else and it's just, it's madness. These latest figures from the Copernicus Climate Change Service unfortunately highlight that we will be exceeding the 1.5 degrees Celsius level on a temporary basis with increasing frequency on a monthly basis. However, it is important to stress that temporary breaches do not mean that the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal is permanently lost because this refers to long-term warming over the past two decades, said WMO Secretary General Celeste Swallow. Swallow? Under the Paris Agreement, countries agreed to keep long-term global average surface temperature well above 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and pursue efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. The scientific community has repeatedly warned that warming of more than 1.5 degrees Celsius risks unleashing far more severe climate change impacts and extreme weather. And every fraction of a degree of a warming matters. Even at current levels of global warming, there are already de devastating climate impacts. These include more extreme heat waves, extreme rainfall events and droughts, reductions in ice sheets, sea ice and glaciers, accelerating sea level rise and ocean heating. June witnessed widespread and prolonged heat waves in many countries with major impacts on all aspects of people's life. This was even before the tradi traditional peak of the normer, Northern Hemisphere, uh, Hemisphere summer, which will undoubtedly see more extreme heat. The record sea surface temperatures are of great concern to vital marine ecosystems, and they also provide energy to supercharged tropical cyclones as we saw with Hurricane Barrel. Now, it's very important to note that all year we've been talking about ocean temperatures, rising ocean temperatures, how cool and cold water, when warmed up, expand, causing sea level rise and further erosion of uh, coastal land. We're seeing all this and more. But it takes time to go over all of it. It takes time to do this. I don't want to just be here rambling about nothing 
I need something tangible in front of me. Otherwise, what, I'm just going to keep saying that climate change is real and leave it at that? No. There, I was told before on my YouTube channel, which had 6,500 subscribers, so proud of that, that there isn't enough news or climate news in a day to do a daily show. And that is precisely what I'm trying to do here. I want to go live every day at 5.30 p.m. with as much news as I can possibly fit in. It's a lot. It can be a lot. I don't want to also give the impression that I'm doom and gloom. I'm not trying to clickbait, and there is no doom scrolling here. I try to be very ambivalent in my journey on this channel here to better inform people. So if like I said, it takes a lot every day to go through all this news to dissect it and give you, you know, thoughts and takes. Because I tell you, if I, like, if you work 80 hours a week, the news probably just pisses you off more. So what I try to do here is talk more about climate change and try to link stories back to climate change. It's not just that we're talking about temperatures around the earth rising, we're talking about global ocean temperatures rising, causing increased powerful hurricanes. That hurricane barrel started by Brazil, northeast of Brazil, past Jamaica, and all the way into Texas, now is heading all the way northeast, all the way to Michigan, Ohio area, where it's going to dump three to five inches of rain. People in Michigan can't ignore the weather in Texas anymore. You see what I mean? It's all related, it's all connected. But it's being able to see that connection that is key. Because without being able to understand that tropical cyclones, the hurricanes, even the unnamed storms are going to get worse. They are getting worse because the storms that are projected to be already on their way are going to be made tremendously worse due to climate change. It doesn't make more storms per se. It makes the storms that are already going to be present far more powerful, more rain, higher wind speeds, and uh, flooding that we probably haven't seen on a wide scale spread, especially the one that we're seeing right now in the Midwest and uh, Central Plains. Waiting for this to load, I apologize. The USGS.gov water data. Now, um, I've never seen flooding like this before. It is a huge widespread uh, swath from Michigan to Illinois, to Indiana, to Ohio. I've never seen flood watches like this. Most of these expire just within the next couple of hours, but most of it expires actually within the next day because from tonight to tomorrow morning or tomorrow evening uh this area in the midwest are going to see record amount of rainfall in a very short amount of time that is <clears throat> three to five inches Now, here's the troubling part, is that I've never seen flooding like this before as, as long as I've been looking at this information, which has been years. 
especially after storms, I usually check for the water gauges. And you see here, Wisconsin, Minnesota. These um, yellow to pink, kind of like salmon color to darker colors, these dots and these squares, all this here, these, these uh, are flood warnings. Each one of these little uh, areas, these uh, hazard lines here, these hazard uh, areas, they're all flood warnings. But what's more devastating is that they're going to have all this water, I mean, three to five inches of water, continue this trend of flooding as the water can no longer head that way, it's going to head the other way. It's going to empty into the lake, Michigan. It's going to empty into other rivers and tributaries and canals and ditches, eventually reaching reaching at a at a at a peak where the ground soil won't be able to absorb as much water any longer. Especially in the in the central plains. When that happens, you get these huge, huge lakes, pretty much, that go on forever. Even at current levels of global warming, there are already devastating climate impacts. These include more extreme heat waves, extreme rainfall events and droughts, reductions in ice sheets, sea ice and glaciers, accelerating sea level rise, and ocean heating. June witnessed widespread and prolonged heat waves in many countries with major impacts on all aspects of people's lives. Life. This was even before the traditional peak of the northern hemisphere. Hemisphere which will undoubtedly see more extreme heat. The record sea surface temperatures are of great concern to vital marine ecosystems and they also provide energy to supercharged tropical cyclones as we saw with Hurricane Barrel. WMO uses six international data sets including ERA-5, for its state of the climate monitoring. It is important to note that other datasets may not confirm the 12-month streak highlighted by Copernicus Climate Change Service due to the relatively small margins above 1.5 degrees Celsius of ERA-5 global temperatures for July and August 2023, May and June 2024, and differences among the various datasets. Copernicus Climate Change Service is implemented by European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast on behalf of the European Commission with funding from the EU. It is routinely pub it, it routinely publishes monthly climate bulletins. Just had this pulled up a minute ago. They are well above the average previous years since record pre-industrial levels. What are we going to do? Even if this specific streak of extremes ends at some point, we are bound to see new records being broken as the climate continues to warm. This is inevitable unless we stop adding greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and the oceans. Also, every time that we have ships that do ocean trawling, all that ocean trawling kicks up all that carbon dioxide and particulates that took over a hundred years to settle down to the ocean floor from the surface of the ocean. All that carbon dioxide gets kicked up from the ocean trawling where they have the giant net with the two weighted sides pulling across. We have all that carbon dioxide is shot back up in the atmosphere, just obliterating what kind of carbon budget we could have for the year. 
because we have like mysterious additions of millions of tons of carbon, hundreds of millions of tons. And it's due to ocean trawling taking between eight to 10 years of, uh, of time to be able to be seen in the atmosphere. 100 years down, 10 years up. It is uh, concerning. Temperature highlights. European temperatures uh, outside Europe, mostly Siberia, mostly over uh, below developing La Nina. Temperatures were below average over the eastern equatorial Pacific, indicating a developed La Nina, but air temperatures over the ocean remained at an unusually high level over many regions. Arctic sea ice extent was 3% below average, close to the values observed most years since 2010. Antarctic sea ice extent was 12% below average, the second lowest extent for June in the satellite data record, behind the lowest June value of negative 16, observed in 2023. Here we are right here. It's concerning that we are constantly seeing a massive amount of sea ice missing when it comes to Antarctica. We occasionally look at sea ice conditions of and around Antarctica. Hmm. Don't know why the rest is not being pulled up. There we go. Now we can see all sorts of massive icebergs.
These are icebergs that are dozens of miles long or kilometers. This is 53 kilometers, this, this iceberg here. Massive. You understand these aren't small bodies of ice. These are giant fresh body, uh, frozen fresh bodies of water. Some of the biggest on the planet. This is iceberg A83A. I had a document where I used to have all my uh, names, but after a computer crashed, the only thing I apparently lost was that document. It was open and why? So much work. I never. It was just a scratch pad. I just. Just got out of the, got in the habit to uh, using a scratch pad and just not really. I could have sworn I was saving it, but that doesn't matter. Hey, we can find them again. We just know that this big guy here is A eighty three A, and that's what's important right now. It rotates, turns, spins around. This iceberg is close to 80 kilometers diagonally. Massive, huge, and it's far out to sea. iceberg right here do not know its designation they move a lot of ice The most recent iceberg has come unglued is this little guy right here. I don't remember his designation, but it is new. But just like the other icebergs, it's going to join them as it crosses into the sea, as it as these currents and winds push it around. The earliest uh, I can see, the little earlier than the third, let's try the 22nd of May. Breaking out like a tooth on there too. How long ago was this? There. We can see not cracked here yet. Although we see the crate the crack happening here. Tooth coming out. I 
can see just how many tiny icebergs there are all over the place. This is Antarctica. Should be a lot of fast ice. What's that? Waves crashing across on the ice. Make it impossible for fast ice to freeze and stay frozen. For animals to use the fast ice as multiple for feeding, for living habitat, for raising their chicks. Very strange behavior. We're seeing a massive amount of sea ice that are escaping. These massive icebergs like this that are all over the place melting. Them melting will result in further sea level rise. And we're not talking about tiny icebergs. Again, we don't know how tall these things really are. We don't know how much far, how further they go beneath. These things could be miles in height, just dragging across throughout the environment. We just don't know. If this iceberg were to hit an island, and immediately register an earthquake, which it did over here. Uh, close to the Larsen shelves and the islands there. This uh, iceberg was stuck a long time. But it's been free. And as you can see, there's more. It's not just everything east of Drake's Passage. It's alarming. This is a catastrophic situation unfolding in Tasmania with massive dieback and ginger tree syndrome affecting eucalypts. You can see the bark peeling. Top of the tree here. Right here is the line. This is a long strip of bark right here. What happens is the trees get really sick, the eucalyptus trees, and they gum out. And the uh, bark starts to peel back and curl, falling towards gravity. It is. Absolutely catastrophic to see trees of this staggering uh, nature that are being wilted down. The 
these giant ancient trees could die. What we're seeing in these trees is what we're seeing in coral reefs, is what we're seeing in human beings, and it's called heat stroke. Heat stroke and al heat stroke in coral is whenever it loses its algae and uh, turns bone white. Usually, sometimes recovers, usually doesn't. Again, this is massive here. You can see where he is standing here, how big these trees are. And uh, what he's standing on once he's around looks to be a lot of the bark that came off as it's, it's sick. You can just see. You can see just how the entire region right here is littered with bark. Bark that. It peeled back. It comes down. Peels down to the bottom of the tree. And they coil out. So we've seen a lot of brown death sweeping across Tasmanian forests, affecting many, many trees. As you can see, they are bone white all over the place. These are, this is not normal. This is heat stroke in these trees. Trees are sick. Grasses as well are turning brown. They're having a lot of brown death throughout Tasmania and West Australia. is uh, heart-wrenching to see. So a little bit of a palate cleanser. Fangs and toilet seat shaped head. Giant salamander-like fossil found in Namibia. About two and a half meters long, creature was an apex predator 280 million years ago, before age of dinosaurs, say scientists. A giant 280 million year old salamander like creature that was an apex predator before the age of the dinosaurs has been discovered by fossil hunters in Namibia. The creature, Gaiasia geniae, was about two and a half meters long, had an enormous toilet seat shaped head and fearsome interlocking fangs. I'd like to see a picture of this. It lurked in cold swampy waters and lakes with its mouth wide open, preparing to clamp down its powerful jaws on any prey uh, unwise enough to swim past. Look. So here's his head, an artist reconstruction of this giant monster.
when we found this enormous specimen just lying on the outcrop as a giant concentration, it was really shocking. That Professor Claudio Marsicano of the University of Buenos Aires, who unearthed the fossil with colleagues, I knew just from seeing that it was that it was something completely different. We were all very excited. Would have been the top predator of its ecosystem and among the largest land predators of the time period, 280 million years ago. The fossil, it's got a big flat toilet seat shaped head, which allows it to open its mouth and suck in prey. It has these huge fangs. The whole front of its mouth is just another giant, it's just giant teeth that Jason Pardo of the Field Museum in Chicago and the co-lead author of a paper describing the fossils. It's a big predator, but potentially also a relatively slow ambush predator. Wait. The fossil is named after the Gaias Formation in Namibia, where it was found, and for Jenny Clack, a paleontologist who specialized in the evolution of early tetrapods, four-limbed vertebrates that gave rise to amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. At least four incomplete fossil specimens were discovered, including skull fragments and an almost complete backbone. The same was uh, pretty massive. I see. But most of the backbone here that we can see, and its head was just giant compared to the rest of his body, you know. This not a little mouth. It was massive and seemed to have small limbs. Definitely just like waiting, waiting. Norway bans salmon fishing on 33 rivers. Four returns have prompted Norwegian authorities to take drastic measures to protect salmon stocks. A steep decline in Atlantic salmon numbers have prompted the Norwegian government to ban salmon fishing on 33 rivers in the southwest of the country. The move was taken at short notice and may spread to other rivers. The Norwegian Environment Agency says this year's salmon runs is well below half of what it should be, and the 2023 returns were 30% down from 2022. The rivers affected by the ban include the world famous Gallo and Orla. The Norwegians blame the sharp decline in Atlantic salmon numbers on climate change and lice from fish farms. Warmer river temperatures reduce smolt size, which in turn increases mortality and reduces the numbers returning successfully to sea. Once back in the ocean, the record high temperatures in the North Atlantic suppress food chains and further impact salmon growth and health. All related. Where Norwegian authorities have so far rejected imposing catch and release for rod caught fish. The ban is proving expensive for visitors. I'm hearing from a lot of angry anglers who have not only lost their long-anticipated fishing holiday, but also their money, says Mr. 
Duffy, the lodges aren't refunding them and their insurers are saying that they're not covered as their holiday isn't canceled. <laughs> they just can't fish. Anglers are used to taking a gamble on the weather, but this is too much. Okay, so there's been an update on the 9th of July. The Norwegian government has announced the famed Gualo River will remain closed for Atlantic salmon fishing for the remainder of the 2024 season. Now this reminds me a lot of um, Alaskan snow crab. Uh, lost in the billions. Either cooked alive in their shells or the sunlight was just too much for them as they uh, didn't have the sea ice above them to uh, reflect the sunlight and keep it cool. So if they molt, they die. They don't molt, they cook in their shells. And we're not just like trying to catch them. It's also uh, Sonar. We're trying to find billions of snow crabs. We wonder why Red Lobster in the United States went out of business when we have over two years without snow crab season. We thought that it'd come back. Thought the numbers would come back if we stopped the fishing. But it wasn't the overfishing, it wasn't the trawling that killed billions of Alaskan snow crabs. They didn't migrate. They didn't move. They cooked. And now we're seeing the same unfolding with salmon. With over 33 rivers are this banned fish. Or at least catching salmon. So it's a lot worse this year. The Norwegian authorities have so far rejected imposing catch and release for rod caught fish. Englishman Colin Duffy is a regular on Norway's salmon rivers, including the Gado. In 2023, more than 51,000 out of the 70,000 rod caught Atlantic salmon in Norway were killed. That is terrible. incredible hopefully that they bounce back but with the temperatures that we're seeing these massive blobs of heat all across the oceans Sea surface temperature is picking up from the Gulf of Mexico. It's going to cause a worse hurricane. Next hurricane is going to be bad. Also, bleaching. Seen a lot of bleaching warnings up in the northeast. Which is something I haven't really seen before. But it's uh, creeping around on the planet once again. Coral reef bleaching.
This is a bit of an older article from the 27th of June. Sharp rise in number of climate lawsuits against companies, report says. About 230 cases filed against corporations and trade associations around the world since 2015. The number of climate lawsuits filed against companies around the world is rising swiftly, a report has found. So one of the most rapidly growing forms of litigation is over climate washing. When companies are accused of misrepresenting their progress towards environmental targets and the analysis found that 47 such cases were filed against companies and governments in 2023. As climate communications and increasingly are, are increasingly scrutinized, there has been a rise in climate washing litigation, often with positive outcomes for those bringing up the cases. Of the 140 climate washing cases reviewed between 2016 and 2023, 77 have officially concluded, 54 of which have ended with a ruling in the favor of the climate claimant. One of the most prominent litigation cases of 2023 was the Montana ruling, where a judge ruled in favor of young Montana residents' claims that state officials had infringed on their right to a clean and healthy environment by promoting fossil fuels. Get it done. This is from Yale Environment 360, published at the Yale School of the Environment. How an early oil industry study became key in climate lawsuits. For decades, 1960s research for the American Petroleum Institute warning of the risk of burning fossil fuels have been forgotten. The two papers discovered in libraries are not playing a key role in lawsuits aimed at holding oil companies accountable for climate change. Carol Muffet began wondering in 2008 when the world's biggest oil companies had first understood the science of climate change and their product's role in causing it. A lawyer then working as a consultant to environmental groups he started researching the question at night and on weekends ordering decades old reports, books, and magazines off Amazon and eBay are from at academic libraries. It became a years long quest and as he pressed on, Muffet noticed one report kept coming up in the footnotes of the memos and papers he was pouring through. A 1968 paper commissioned by the American Petroleum Institute, the powerful fossil fuel trade group and written by Elmer Robinson and Bob Robbins, scientist at the Stanford Research Institute known as SRI. Muffet wasn't sure what it said, <laughs> but it was cited so often he knew there must be something big in it. Then part of Stanford University, SRI wasn't an ordinary department, but a contact research outfit that had been intertwined from its founding with oil and gas interest. The paper had been delivered privately to the Petroleum Institute, not published like typical academic work, and only a few copies had spilled into the public realm. Long since forgotten, they had been gathering dust in a handful of university libraries. Eventually, though, an interlibrary loan, Muffet managed to get a hold of one. Once I actually opened it, it was immediately clear how profoundly important it was, he remembers. It was absolutely a jaw drop moment. This was the earliest, most detailed, and most direct evidence Muffet had yet seen that the industry's own experts had warned against 
has warned its largest trade organization, not just an individual company, that the science around climate change was clear. It was abundant and that the best indications were that the risks were really substantial. The paper's delivery date put it well before Exxon's extensive 1970s research into climate risks. In stark terms, the decades-old paper explained that the world's use of fossil fuels was releasing carbon that had been buried for millennia, and it's likely that noticeable increases in temperature could occur if that burning continued. That would mean warming oceans, melting ice caps, and sea levels that could rise by as much as four feet per decade, the report predicted. There seems to be no doubt that the potential damage to our environment could be severe, the authors concluded. The prospect for the future must be of serious concern. The Center for International Environmental Law and Advocacy Group Muffet now runs published excerpts in 2016. Now the paper, along with the follow-up that Robinson and Robbins produced in 1969, is playing a key role in the wave of lawsuits seeking to hold oil companies accountable for climate change. A report of uh, sources, abundance, and fate of gaseous atmospheric pollutants knew the entire time this is why there has to be aliens because they don't care about this planet they don't care about the fate of this planet they don't care about human lives how can you be such a psychopath to know that your children's children is not going to have a future you want to set up a dynasty for your family for your for your children and their children but in doing so, you doomed everybody. Minnesota, Delaware, Rhode Island, Baltimore, and Honolulu are among about two dozen U.S. states, Baltimore, and localities suing industry. Some of the cases seem compensation for the damage wrought by climate-driven disasters like floods, fires, and heat waves, plus the cost of preparing for future impacts. So not only was this known before, it was known how bad it could get. The previous generation of ours doomed us all they saw profits over safety, over humanity, any sort of life. Um, everything that we cover on this channel is just coming to fruition when it comes to climate change and where we find ourselves as a species on this planet. And why are we continuing to do the things that we're doing? These problems are not going away. Why are we making it worse? And we've known for decades, decades, the extent of and the dangers of burning fossil fuels, putting that into the atmosphere. We've known the extent of ocean floor trawling and how much carbon dioxide that kicks up into the atmosphere. We've known these things. That we still do it. Why? It's pretty incredible that we can see the end, that we can feel the heat, yet we're just going to keep driving forward. We can't. Take a break. Can't stop. 
Is it because people have jobs and we can't quit because that would mean people lose their jobs? I understand that. What we're talking about is entire countries getting wrecked. We're talking about continental erosion. We're talking about rainfall that comes and goes and leaves many inches of water behind it. As we're seeing right now with this hurricane barrel, as it makes its way into the Midwest and Central Plains. Minnesota, Delaware, Rhode Island, yeah, I read that already. Last month, New Jersey became the most recent state to sue. Last month, New Jersey became the most recent state to sue as a result of the fossil fuels industry's lies and deceit the state had paid billions of dollars to clean up climate change induced disasters like Superstorm Sandy to fortify the Jersey Shore from future storms and to protect its people, businesses, infrastructure, and natural resources from a myriad of other climate change hazards, its complaint charged. It is time to halt this deceptive conduct and place responsibility for emitting its effects on defendants where it belongs rather than the taxpayers of New Jersey. There's plenty of evidence of fossil fuel companies' early awareness of climate risks, some now even predating 1968. Indeed, the science was already a matter of public discussion in the mid-1960s. And the Robinson and Robbins papers are just two of the many documents the court filings marshal. Others include Inside Climate News and the Los Angeles Times 2015 reports on Exxon's internal climate research and its use of that science to prepare its assets to withstand dangers as such as rising seas and intensifying storms. Those investigations focused mainly on the 1970s and later, after the papers by Robinson and Robbins were written. But those papers pack a unique punch that goes beyond just the early dates, said Richard Wiles, president of the Center for Climate Integrity, an advocacy group that works with localities considering climate litigation. The industry can't say they didn't know when they commissioned the study. That will be key if any of the pending cases reaches trial, said Patrick Parentu, emeritus professor and senior climate policy fellow at Vermont Law School. There's going to be a ferocious fight over evidence and the validity the admissibility of these various documents, according to Parentu, and the Robinson and Robbins papers direct link to industry makes it more likely a judge would admit them. The involvement of the American Petroleum Institute, whose members include nearly all the biggest oil producers, also widens the scope of knowing culpability well beyond ExxonMobil the company for which the most detailed evidence of early knowledge of climate science exists, said Wiles. The Petroleum Institute declined an interview request. 
The record of the past two decades demonstrates that the industry has achieved its goal of providing affordable, reliable American energy to U.S. consumers while substantially reducing emissions and our environmental footprint, it said in a statement. Any suggestion to the contrary is false. While the idea of litigating over a problem as big as climate change may seem like a leap, this is classic product liability law, Parentu said. The law is not novel at all. The law is plain vanilla. The consequences are huge. The stakes are enormous. That's what makes the cases different. The report Robinson and Robbins delivered, its ungainly title was Sources, Abundance, and Fate of Gaseous Atmospheric Pollutants, was thorough and detailed, 123 pages long. They surveyed six different pollutants, five of which were harmful mainly to those who breathe them or to crops or in other plant life. The six carbon dioxide posed a different problem, Robinson and Robbins explained. Many didn't even think of it as a pollutant, they wrote. A perspective that was perhaps fortunate for our present mode of living, centered as it is around carbon combustion. But the men believed it belonged in their review because it was the only air pollutant that would, which has proven to be of global importance. It was ironic, they noted, that while much attention had focused on pollutants whose damage was local and discreet, Almost no one seemed concerned about carbon dioxide's potential to wreak havoc on a far wider scale. That dynamic had shaped efforts to reduce pollination, sorry, pollution, they noted as better technology began cleaning up the country's air. What is lacking, Robinson and Robbins wrote, was work towards systems in which CO2 emissions would be brought under control. Their science wasn't groundbreaking. What Robinson and Robbins provided was simply a clear-eyed distillation of an emergence, emerging consensus. In 1965, in a message to Congress, President Lyndon Johnson, whose scientific advisors warned him about climate change, had written that this generation has altered the composition of the atmosphere on a global scale, in part because of a steady increase in carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels. Reading that presidential letter was what prompted Carol Muffet to begin the digging that led him to Robinson and Robbins' reports. When the White House is raising concerns about your product's impacts on the planet, he remembers wondering, what responsible CEO or corporate executive doesn't know everything about the issue in question? So he started reading corporate histories, notes from conferences, anything that helped him understand how oil and gas companies worked and what they cared about. This stuff was publicly available in the sense that it was not locked away in a vault, he explains, but it was hard to find, tucked away, tucked behind paywalls in corporate and scientific archives, or couched in obscure language that made searching difficult. There was a lot of information hiding out there in plain sight. When he finally got his hands on Robinson's, Robinson and Robbins' first report, he understood the legal consequences immediately. While even earlier documentation had since emerged, at the time the SRI paper was, as, was the earliest and most direct. Evidence Muffet had seen that industry leaders were aware of the dangers continued fossil fuel use could pose. Within a few weeks of releasing details of the paper, 
Inside Climate News also reported his finding of the recalls. I had a lawyer calling me saying, can you send me a copy? And there was more. The one copy they can find in the United States. It seemed the American Petroleum Institute had asked for more, and this time the scientists offer even greater detail. They cited models predicting atmospheric carbon dioxide would reach 370 parts per million by 2000, astonishingly close to the actual reading of 369.71 at millennials end. Such an increase, they said, would raise global temperatures by a half degree Celsius. That was on the money too. Polar ice cap melting caused by further warming, Robinson and Robbins wrote, would obviously result in inundation of coastal areas. The Clean Air Act that keeps getting gutted is the only valid tool for regulating greenhouse gases. This global challenge does not lend itself to a patchwork of baseless lawsuits in state courts pursuant to state laws. Chevron lawyer Theodore Boltros said last month, Judges have so far ruled against the companies on that important procedural issue, repeatedly returning the suits to state courts, which are seen as more favorable to plaintiffs. Now the U.S. Supreme Court is weighing companies' request that it intervene to move the cases to federal court. The justices have asked the Justice Department for its viewing before deciding. If the cases eventually get before state court juries, advocates for the litigation strategy contend they could extract massive damages or big settlements from industry, as happened in litigation over tobacco, opiates, and asbestos. Like the climate suits, those cases alleged corporate deception leveled at the public for decades, resulting in a huge cost to all society, said Ben Franta. Senior Climate Litigation Research Fellow at Oxford University Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment, who has advised some climate plaintiffs. They are good examples that the legal system can take on big societal harms that the other branches of government, frankly, are just not addressing. The lawsuits could accelerate a clean energy transition by scaring investment away from oil and gas. If fossil fuel companies are forced to internalize even a fraction of the damage that they cause to society through global warming, then that completely changes the commercial attractiveness of those companies as investments. Their litigation exposure could be enormous ultimately. What about the cases are likely to drag on for years and the fight is sure to be brutal.
Robin Robinson died in 2016 at As director, Robinson, who died in 2016 at 91, worked mostly from an office in town, but now and then he would make the long, steep ascent to the observatory. Once he brought a National Geographic reporter along, and they wound together through lava fields, sometimes jagged as cinders, sometimes smooth as world chocolate, the journalist wrote, up the clouds gazing at a mesmerizing view. Robinson told the writer that observatory records showed atmospheric carbon dioxide had risen 27% since the mid-1800s. Given the gas holds heat close to the Earth, the greenhouse effect is not a wild idea. It's pretty basic physics. As the years went by and the companies he had warned so long ago kept digging and drilling, he oversaw the record, the recording of numbers that climbed higher and higher. From the side of a Hawaiian volcano, Elmer Robinson watched his prediction come true. From Beth Gardiner, Gardiner. This was an article from November 30th, 2022. It reads just like yesterday. Without knowing the date beforehand, would you have known this was an old article? I probably wouldn't, because it just sounds so close to what we're seeing right now. This is 2022, November 30th. Excellent article. Very, very informative regarding climate lawsuits that are going on, that are going to go on for years. Because the only way to stop them is the only way to slow it down is to stop them in the courts, to find them with such massive fines that they eventually will stop uh, funding it. Too expensive, too dangerous, too many risks, too many factors. So right now, we see in the southwest United States tens of thousands of old oil drill spots that are just left. Dengue fever is surging worldwide. A hotter planet will make it worse. Climate change helped fuel an explosion of dengue cases in the Americas, including Puerto Rico, as mosquitoes multiply in warmer, wetter weather. This news story was written by Lena H. Sun and Sarah Kaplan. Dengue fever is surging worldwide. A hotter planet will make it worse. San Juan, Puerto Rico. The curly-haired girl came to the emergency room with fever, aches, and signs of dehydration, 
common indications of many childhood illnesses. But the nine-year-old, pale and listless beneath her Pokemon blanket, looked sicker than most children and exhibited no rest. The curly-haired uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico. The curly-haired girl came to the emergency room with fever, aches, and signs of dehydration, a common indication of many childhood illnesses. But the nine-year-old, pale and listless beneath her Pokemon blanket, looked sicker than most children and exhibited no respiratory symptoms. She could only whimper as a pediatrician stroked her hair and softly questioned her in Spanish. The sharp-eyed doctor suspected dengue disease as often missed, but is now exploding around the world. The storm's coming, folks. Grayson Brown, executive director of the nonprofit Puerto Rico Vector Control Unit, advised a group of California officials in a recent webinar. It's here in Puerto Rico, but you guys are going to feel it pretty soon. Last week, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention warned of an increased risk of dengue infections in the United States, urging clinicians to stay on alert for the disease when treating feverish patients who have traveled to places with dengue transmission. There is no cure for the virus, which in severe cases can lead to plasma leaking from veins, internal bleeding, organ failure, and in rare instances, death. Unlike other illnesses, vaccination is complicated. Few options are available and few people know about them. The only vaccine available in the United States is for children 9 to 16 years old who have already been infected with dengue, those most vulnerable to hospitalization but it won't be available until after 2026. Without drastic action to control the virus and slow climate change, research suggests that some 2 billion additional people across the globe could be at risk for dengue fever in the next 50 years. Rising temperatures spur global dengue spread. It has been more than a decade. Since Puerto Rico saw its last dengue outbreak. Though the virus is endemic to the territory and typically recurs every five to seven years, that cycle was interrupted by the emergence of Zika a closely related virus that tore through the island in 2016 and gave some cross protection against dengue and the isolation measures necessitated by the coronavirus. But the return of global travel, especially Caribbean cruises, brought tourists, thousands of tourists who had been exposed to dengue elsewhere, introducing strains that hadn't been dominant in Puerto Rico. The virus spread swiftly through the population of suspected people, reaching Genesis in late May. The girl had been feverish for several days before she arrived at the hospital. Her doctor pressed on the girl's fingertip and saw it took longer than normal for the color beneath to return to pink, a sign of dehydration. More concerning, the doctor noted she had been vomiting and her count of blood platelets were low. Rivera admits the girl to the hospital amid signs her condition was deteriorating. Genesis was one of the 91 dengue cases reported in Puerto Rico that week, health department data show. Meanwhile, 
human-caused warming is spawning an explosion of mosquitoes here. Greenhouse gas emissions, mostly from burning fossil fuels, have raised average temperatures in the Commonwealth by about 2 degrees Fahrenheit since 1950, according to the National Centers for Climate Information. Change has been a boon to uh, Aedes aegypti. Uh, which is able to transmit diseases at higher temperatures, uh, species of mosquito. Models in real-world data show that these mosquitoes can transmit dengue at temperatures ranging from 64 to 94.1 degrees Fahrenheit, conditions that are found in Puerto Rico every month of the year. Only dengue U.S. vaccine runs out in 2026. So the longer the warm spells stay, the more chances of these mosquitoes breeding and traveling and infecting people. winter cold once kept it at bay starting to see an increase in dengue fever across the planet climate induced droughts can prompt people to stockpile water creating more mosquito habitat escalating hurricanes and floods also produce standing water while simultaneously forcing people from their homes and increasing their exposure to mosquitoes And now, access to the vaccine is closing. A few months before Puerto Rico declared its public health emergency in March, Sanofi informed U.S. officials that it stopped producing Dengvaxia because of low demand. The last doses will expire in August 2026. So essentially, in Puerto Rico, there is a huge challenge regarding combating these mosquitoes that carry this disease. And as climate shifts, as areas become wetter and hotter, allowing for mosquitoes to breed in larger areas, you're able to spread the disease a greater range. This in today. It's so hot in New York City 
that the Third Avenue bridge over the Harlem River can't fully open close because the heat has expanded the steel. We saw workers using a saw to shave part of the steel down and fireboats shooting water on the bridge to cool it down. This is, this is rad. He's gonna get in there deep enough. This is, he's just working to do it. That is wild. Hopefully it returns back to its normal shape, but probably not. This steel expansion is too much. That is wild. Bridge can't close. So if you have temperature that's like 90 degrees Fahrenheit on the outside, and you're looking at the blacktop being over 115 degrees, in incredible temperatures all across the board when it comes to the entire country. Also, the sun feels hotter. It is the 13th month in a row where temperatures just keep getting hotter. Well, with extreme temperatures, we're going to see more failures like this. Very large bridge, and it currently can't close. Something to look look up in a few days to see if they are uh, able to get the actual bridge to close. Officials plan to kill 450,000 invasive owls that are endangering native owls. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service plans to kill about 450,000 invasive barred owls to save spotted owls in the Pacific Northwest. To save one vulnerable owl species, the federal government has a contentious plan, killing hundreds of thousands of another owl species. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service said its proposal released last week might be the only way to save this spotted owl whose population had has rapidly decreased in recent decades due to competition over food and shelter from an invasive spe owl species. Shooting roughly 450,000 barred owls over three decades could help sp spotted owls in the Pacific Northwest rebound.
So they're going to have snipers go out there into the woods and uh, shoot as many barred owls as they possibly can. Reduce the number so that spotted owl numbers can stabilize. It seems extreme. It seems extreme to have trained shooters go out there and snipe these birds. It seems, it seems extreme, excessive. We're talking about half a million barred owls over three decades. The Fish and Wildlife Service said in December 2020 that northern spotted owls should be reclassified to an endangered species after their population dropped by about 75% and two decades okay so that is that is substantial some areas where about 200 spotted owls lived in the early 2000s now contain two or three of the birds wildlife officials considered several options to preserve spotted owls, but said they wouldn't be effective. Sterilizing barred owls would often take at least a decade before a significant population decline. Aging them would be expensive and difficult, and relocation wasn't an option since wildlife officials on the East Coast said they don't have room for the birds. Killing the barred owls will make the largest impact, the Fish and Wildlife Service said. The agency has at least 30 days to decide if it will proceed with the plan to shoot the owls, which would only be the latest project to kill invasive species in hopes of protecting other animals. Federal and state agencies have also killed Burmese pythons, feral hogs, nutria rodents, and barn owls. If the shooter is within 100 feet of an owl and has a clear shot, they can shoot. Brown said people trained in firearms would walk through forests in the dead of night with sh shotguns, flashlights, and megaphones to replicate a barred owl call in hopes of attracting them. Once an owl has settled on a nearby tree, the shooters must identify it through the bar-shaped spots of its brown and white feathers and it's call, which is known to sound like who cooks for you who cooks for y'all if the shooter is within about 100 feet of the owl and has a clear shot they can shoot the carcasses could be buried on site or used for research Bound said officials said they'd aim to kill about 15,000 barred owls per year starting as early as this fall And they can get everybody together to kill these barred owls. You have to show documentation of firearms training and experience in identifying owls and using firearms to participate. I mean, like, just anybody. It allows them just anybody just come up along and, uh, as long as they can tell the difference between the owls. Uh, hopefully this works i don't recall a, such a a massive uh calling effort before in the states well the um the article did mention other uh other callings i don't think any has been as much as a half a million When the northern spotted owl was listed as threatened, 
on the Endangered Species Act in 1990, wildlife officials listed the barred owl as a potential threat to their population, Baum said. The barred owl population continued to increase in the Pacific Northwest until the invasive species and habitat loss were identified as spotted owl's primary threats in 2008. When the Northern Spotted Owl was listed as threatened on the Endangered Species Act in 1990, wildlife officials listed the barred owl as a potential threat to their population, Bound said. The barred owl population continued to increase in the Pacific Northwest until the invasive species and habitat loss were identified as spotted owl's primary threats in 2008, Bound said. However, some animal welfare advocates still consider the agency plans to be misguided. Animal Wellness Action, an animal welfare nonprofit, said 135 wildlife organizations have signed this letter to Interior Secretary Deb Holland asking for the plan to be revoked. Wayne Akali, the group's founder said he thinks barred owls will continue heading to the Pacific Northwest after the project, allowing their populations to rebound. He said the agency is trying to play God. Claire Catania, the executive director of Birds Connect Seattle, a bird conservation group, said she thinks the Fish and Wildlife Services plan is necessary. While the spotted owl was once an iconic species in Washington, Katina said, Katania said, most of the state's new residents have only seen barred owls. We are deeply saddened that it has come to this point. Morin, the Fish and Wildlife Field Supervisor, said she wants Pacific Northwest residents to have the chance to appreciate both owl species. This isn't about, this isn't at all about one owl versus another. This is about having spotted owls. If we do nothing, we will only have barred owls. If we do something, we'll have both. Pretty massive plan. You have the that's pretty incredible. I thank you for joining me here so far. I do appreciate it. If you haven't already, please follow the Twitch channel. I am just starting on Twitch. And uh, I'm not sure if it's um, if there are ways to advertise, ways to get the stream out. I'm not sure yet. I had over 6,500 subscribers on my YouTube channel before I came to Twitch. What I'll do is I will record and stream the show on Twitch and then upload the show on YouTube on my channel. That way I can still try to get both uh, social media uh, uh, video sites Old pipes cost Texas cities to lose tens of billions of gallons of water each year. Texas's most populous cities lost roughly 88 billions
Texas's most populous cities lost roughly 88 billion gallons of water last year because of aging water infrastructure and extreme heat, costing them millions of dollars and straining the state's water supply, according to self-reported water loss audits. So let's see, uh, here's how much each of Texas's biggest cities lost last year, according to their self-reported audits. Houston, 38.8, 38.8. 31.8 billion, San Antonio, 19.5 billion, Dallas, 17.6 billion, Austin, 7.1 billion, Fort Worth, 5.9 billion, El Paso, 4.8 billion. Not sustainable. Is this problem unique to Texas? Are there other states that are losing billions of gallons of water due to the infrastructure? Maybe Michigan? The city of the cities of Houston and Dallas saw the biggest increase in lost water reported. Houston saw a 30% jump from last year's audit, while Dallas saw an increase of 18%. Houston is the largest populous city in the state, home to roughly 2.3 million Texans. It lost around 31 billion gallons of water last year. This is massive. This isn't something that can just be swept from the rug, it's just, it's being made worse. It is exacerbated. Climate change is making it worse, droughts making it worse. Droughts cause clay and soil to dry up and shrink, stressing older water lines and making them more likely to break and leak. Officials said this, combined with aging infrastructure, led to a significant increase in water leaks across the city. This is serious. This probably isn't just unique to Texas. But are other cities and states and localities, are they seeing any kind of losses like this? Texas 2036, an Austin-based think tank, expects the state needs to spend more than $150 billion USD over the next 50 years on water infrastructure. Pretty incredible. This is from the Texas Tribune by Juan Salinas II. I thank you for joining me here. I do have a Patreon, One Great Earth. I create climate related videos on Twitch and YouTube.
was after my ads account was suspended on YouTube, I created this Patreon before I I thank you for joining me. Even if you're watching this on replay, I appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much for your viewership. It is uh, over two hours. I believe I will be calling the stream here. I thank you very much for your interest in these topics and uh, what I have to say and what I show. I thank you very much. I will go live every day at 5.30 p.m. That's something that I should update with in my Twitch. There's a lot of information to go over. And I still have so much more that I didn't get a chance to today. All right. I thank you very much. Please take care.